Um, yeah, the topic of my um, presentation this morning is the legal aspects of biodiversity. Um, as we've heard, this is a growing practice, not only in South Africa, but also internationally. Um, in South Africa, this seems at the moment to be happening through environmental impact assessments and offsets are, are made conditions of an environmental authorization. There are some cases where there are agreements between government and, um, and applicants around offset agreements to happen in the future. Um, but there's very little around, um, as Doug said, around the implementation, the success of it, and, and monitoring. So today I'm essentially going to look at um, the policy that's been developed um, internationally as well as in South Africa. We have what's known as evolving policy. Um, and then also to look at our existing legislation. Um, and does it allow for um, biodiversity offsets in its current form? Um, in terms of evolving practice, I, I, I looked at these um, sort of key sources. Um, arising out of the Convention of Biological Diversity is the Business and Biodiversity Offsets Program. Um, it has about 75 organizations that participate from government, conservation agencies, um, financial institutions. Um, and they've developed a number of, of resources and handbooks and guidelines based on international practice and practice in, in various countries. Um, at the moment, there's also the um, National Biodiversity Offsets Policy Framework being developed um, by SAMB in terms of the National Biodiversity Framework. And then also at provincial level, we have in the Western Cape and KZN Wildlife guidelines that have been produced. Gauteng is in the process of producing theirs. And offsets are also covered to some degree in, for example, in Pumalanga's Biodiversity Conservation Plan Handbook. Um, drawing from these sources, just to give you an idea or, um, of, of how biodiversity offsets are, are defined, essentially they are actions designed to compensate for significant um, residual adverse biodiversity impacts. And the goal of biodiversity impacts is to achieve no net loss and preferably a net gain of biodiversity. In essence, it's compensation for significant residual impacts after application of the mitigation hierarchy. And residual impacts are defined as those impacts that remain after all reasonable and practical changes um, to the location, siting, scale, layout, technology, and design of a proposed development um, in order to avoid, minimize, and or repair and restore negative impacts. If we look um, what is meant by mitigation hierarchy in terms of the business and biodiversity offset program, um, let me just see if I can. Um, essentially, uh, we have the predicted impact in the yellow. Um, this is the avoidance. Um, then we have mitigation, um, restoration, and this is the residual impact that's left after these mitigation measures. And with the um, offset um, being applied with preferably a, a net positive impact. If we look at our provincial guidelines, um, they're almost identical in KZN in Western Cape. Um, it's essentially an inverted triangle of avoid, prevent, minimize, um, and restore. And the impacts you have left after you've applied those three are the residual impacts. And that's where you, you would look to apply an offset. Um, in both our, the provincial guidelines that are available, they set the trigger as, um, for biodiversity offsets as the significance of the residual negative impacts on biodiversity. If you get uh, very high significance, um, offsets are inappro inappropriate as they could not compensate for the loss of biodiversity. In the medium to high significant range is where you'd look to explore um, um, offsets and low significance, essentially there's no need for a biodiversity offset. And the significance is heavily influenced by the characteristics of the receiving environment. And many of these are critical biodiversity areas, priority areas, protected areas, threatened ecosystems. Um, and at the bottom there, we have the area identified provincial, by provincial conservation authorities as being irreplaceable um, from biodiversity conservation practice. So this, this would be considered in, in rate in the significance of a residual impact. Um, there are a number of other principles. Um, the BBOP has about 10 principles, um, and these are very uh, similar to uh, what's in the provincial guidelines. 
Um, in the provincial guidelines, we have a focus on the EIA process at project level, but there's also rec recognition of the importance of strategic and system um, systematic planning. Um, essentially, in terms of offsets, you have area-based, uh, looking to secure and or rehabilitate either like-for-like -like areas or trading up, where you offset in an area that hi has higher conservation value. Um, and then the guidelines also provide guidance on the type, location, size, and methods um, of securing an area. Um, essentially, that's what's in, in, in the policy um, guidelines that I've looked at. I'm now going to look at um, our, what our legislation says about offset guidelines. Um, essentially, we have the uh, Constitution, Section 24. I'm not going to go through that. And then to look to NEMA, the Biodiversity Act, um, Promotion of Administrative Justice Act, and also the Protected Areas Act. Um, internationally, we have um, the Convention of Bi on Biological Diversity. And then other national legislation, depending on what type of development would be, would, uh, could be the Minerals and Petroleum Resource Development Act, which contains um, uh, procedures for, for an, and requirements for an EMP, also closure certificates that deal with residual impacts. And um, we also have our national planning legislation that's um, in the process of being finalized, and um, various acts around uh, local governments, and then also key provincial legislation on conservation and planning. Um, in Lima, essentially, um, there are three main areas uh, that apply to biodiversity offsets. Section 2 principles I'll discuss firstly. Um, these are, have to serve as guidelines um, for any organ of state exercising any function when taking a decision in terms of NEMA or any statutory provision uh, that relates to the protection of the environment. Um, they're also important for guiding the interpretation, administration, and implementation of, um, of NEMA. Um, there's only one place in the whole of NEMA that actually refers to biodiversity um, at all, and that's in um, section 24A1 um, within the definition of or the practice of sustainable development. And that requires that the disturbance of ecosystems and loss of biodiverse, uh, biological diversity are avoided. And where they cannot all to be, be avoided, they're minimized and remedied. Um, and then at the bottom here is a, is a further principle that basically echoes this, but in a, in a more generic way. If we take the um, model that is in our, most of our provincial guidelines, the mitigation hierarchy, and we compare that to what NEMA provides for, we can see that um, avoidance in the mitigation hierarchy is, is the same, and we also have minimize. Um, we have the word remedy, and it's really to check from a legal perspective whether repair and restore and offset um, can fall within this definition of remedy. Um, we can also portray this NEMA model of mitigation hierarchy as a flatter structure um, because it talks about minimizing and remedying. Um, and, but regardless, it's again as whether this offset fits into this definition of remedy. There's no legal de definition of remedy in our legislation. The closest we come in is the draft um, national standards for um, contaminated land, but that's very specific to eliminating contaminants, so it's not much help. Um, if we look to the Oxford Dictionary, it contains many circular references to a limited group of words, but importantly, it's about repairing um, the damage done, but it also includes compensation. So if we go back to what NEMA allows for, um, there does look like there's comfortable provision, or certainly NEMA doesn't prohibit the consideration of offsets in, in what it calls for in remedy. There's a num number, um, number of other Section 2 principles. Um, I know you're familiar with these, the precautionary principle, the polluter pays principle, public participation, responsibility th um, throughout the life cycle. Again, these would need to be looked at in terms of biodiversity offsets um, when making a decision whether to, uh, to um, proceed in that manner. The next main section of NEMA that talks to biodiversity sets is Chapter 5 that um, provides for integrated environmental management. I'm not going to go through all these uh, next slides in detail, um, but just to alert you to the fact 
that Section 22 principles are heavily entrenched in the practice of environmental management, um, integrated environmental management. Um, Section 24 is, is very long and detailed. It's a regarding um, environmental authorizations. Um, again, from biodiversity offset, it doesn't mention them in any detail, but it talks about more generically about mitigation measures, recommendations, management of consequences, assessment of effectiveness. So these are the, um, the guidelines or, or the requirements when uh, applying for environmental authorization, deciding whether to allow uh, to proceed with an, a biodiversity offset is to look what's provided for in, in this chapter. Um, section 24G, which is the rectification of unlawful commencement or continuation of listed activity, also allows for mitigation measures um, and also may require an EMP. And again, it's at that broad level that biodiversity offsets could, could um, come into play. Um, in terms of Section 24J, um, these talk to implementation guidelines and that the minister or MEC with the concurrence of the minister may publish guidelines. Um, I think in, in the beginning of the Western Cape's biodiversity offset guidelines, it actually refers to the section, and this is sitting in the queue um, once the concurrence of the minister has been obtained to publish these guidelines. So that's the sort of legal status of, of the Western Cape's guidelines at the moment. Um, again, very generic in terms of the EMP, what must be um, contained, mitigation, management, protection, remedial measures. Again, very bro broadly couched and certainly not prohibiting biodiversity offsets. Um, this is quite an important section in terms of the criteria that the authorities have to um, consider or take into account when considering applications. Again, quite generically couched in terms of mitigation measures. They also need to take into account line any guidelines, departmental policies and decision-making instruments that have been developed or um, other information in possession of the competent authority. And again, this could relate to the, the provincial guidelines, the norms and standards, or the national policies that's been developed. And they also have to take into account the comments of any organ of state um, charged with the administrative um, administration of any law. And again, this is where often where the provincial conservation authorities and departments can come into play. Um, with their approach to biodiversity offsets. The EIA regulations provide more detail on Section, on section 24 in NEMA, um, um, and they, they, in more detailed procedural requirements. The definitions don't really take um, us any further in understanding um, biodiversity offsets. Um, they have requirements for a number of the uh, reports um, for various applications. Again, the guide, our provincial guidelines talk about offset reports, and this could comfortably fit under specialist and specialized processes, and also an offset management plan, um, which I presume would comfortably fit in an environmental management program. The companion guideline that's recently been published this month um, also doesn't take us any further in understanding mitigation of impacts. Content of reports, um, the EIA regula regulations specify what must be in there. Again, quite broad, but just to bring your attention to any relevant guidelines and any departmental policies, environmental management instruments, and any other decision-making instruments developed or adopted by the, the competent authority. Um, the regs also talk about the... Um, the conditions that a competent authority might, may oppose in environmental authorization. Um, and again, interesting here, this number E, uh, section E, where applicable, the manner in which and when the competent authority will approve the EMP. Um, um, and this could talk to biodiversity offset programs that are perhaps not fully fledged when a decision is taken. And then, quite broadly, any other condition that the competent authority considers necessary for the protection of environment. So, again, we have this very broad provision that would allow for, well, certainly doesn't prohibit biodiversity offsets. Um, there are other sections of NEMA that could be explored. Um, section 28 and 30, where the authority has the ability to issue um, directives, and it talks about remedying the effects of degradation. Again, this could be a potential avenue for, for offsets as well. Um, also in terms of compliance notice, any steps the person must take um, in relation to environmental degradation. 
Um, I'm going to just rush through these. There's various provisions in EMA also for conclusion of agreements, expropriation of land, um, reservation of state land, again, and these have potential for application of securing biodiversity areas. Um, the, the other act that I'll just touch on briefly is the Biodiversity Act. It allows uh, for the minister to issue norms and standards, um, and also for the, uh, the National Biodiversity Framework. Um, also allows for um, lists of ecosystems that are threatened. And again, this influences the significant rating of residual negative impacts that I spoke about previously. Um, importantly, in terms of our national biodiversity framework, um, one of the strategic objectives is enabling policy and legislative framework. And an action under priority action three is to develop a national policy framework for biodiversity offsets. And this is currently being developed by SAMBI at the moment. Um, the decisions made in terms of NEMA are administrative decisions, so then they fall under, uh, under PAJA, the Promotion of Administrative Justice Act, and again, action that has to be lawful, reasonable, and procedurally fair, um, and that has to be taken into account when decisions are made around biodiversity offsets. There's a lot of case law around administrative law that then determines um, lawfulness, reasonableness, and, and those three principles that I've already discussed. Um, so there's a whole host of other legislation that can, can come into play. We obviously don't have time to go there today. Um, looking at international practice, I've already mentioned the Business and Biodiversity Operational Program, um, and that came out of the ninth meeting of the Conference of Parties in 2008. Um, it's, if you don't know this site, they have a, a wonderful website with lots of resources, handbooks, glossaries, um, it's certainly, and, and um, case studies from all over the world. It's certainly uh, useful to look at. Foreign law and, and um, practice, uh, same in South Africa, it's also ad hoc and uh, evolving practice, been in operation for longer in North America, as Doug mentioned. South Africa is probably one of the few countries in Africa that's actually looking at it seriously. Um, and around the world, there's um, uh, various strengths and weaknesses, but, but, but fairly new policy as well. Um, interesting, New Zealand, their law on biodiversity offsets has been develop, developed through the environmental court. Um, and the court, in a, in a particular court case, ruled that there is provision in their Resource Management Act in the wider definition of remedy, which is the same word that uh, um, appears in our, in our act. Um, the, the courts also developed a definition of environmental compensation and also guidelines. And in New Zealand at the moment, um, they're busy uh, developing a national policy as well as practice guidelines. Okay, one minute. <laughs> um, just in conclusion then, I, I, I think South Africa is getting there. We, we, um, it's evolving practice, and we also have developing policy. Um, at the moment, it does appear to be inconsistent in ad hoc process, um, practice, especially if you look at conditions in various um, uh, authorizations. Um, we do seem to be in line with evolving international and foreign practice. I don't think Trevor Noah got his skit for the world going this way and South Africa going that way from, from biodiversity practice. Um, there's nothing in our law that seems to prohibit biodiversity imp, um, offsets, um, but we do need um, far more certainty and a far more coordinated direction from our legal framework. Um, just a caution in developing policy and guidelines to avoid creating um, new procedural and reporting requirements that are not provided for in our law. And this is particularly around EIAs. Um, from what I've seen proposed is these sort of interlocutory um, assessments or an assessment within an assessment process, and just whether our legislation does allow that as it is currently written. Um, and just the need and scope for biodiversity offset planning outside of project-specific um, EIAs. And this will come through a lot of the conservation plans and, and a lot of the other planning that's in the process, um, but not all being coordinated as yet. Thanks very much. Thank you.